thank you for letting me go first. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather and I uh, hope you don't mind that I sit here on the chair. Uh, so uh, yeah, my name is Solrun. I am uh, an archeologist and uh, a project manager at the Cultural Heritage Agency of Iceland. It's been great to be here today and listen to all the keynote speakers. It was very informative and interesting and I'm looking forward to this session and I hope I can uh, make it through. Uh, but uh, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about a 3D modeling project uh, we did last year at the Cultural Heritage Agency. Um, I am no specialist in, in 3D modeling, and uh, this was our first attempt in, uh, in this type of uh, a project. And uh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> Stina. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this was our, our first attempt. So uh, we were lucky. We called our colleagues at NICO uh, and uh, asked them to help us with this uh, project. And they have uh, been making three dimensional models for, I think, uh, around 10 years. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we were very lucky to get the specialist in to, to help us uh, with this. Uh, our first try of 3D modeling archaeological sites in Iceland. Uh, just to start, how did the project come about? Um, as you might have heard, we had a volcanic eruption last year uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the Reykjanes Peninsula in Geldingadalir, to be exact. And uh, the 3D modeling project was one of the measures we took regarding preservation of scheduled monuments that were at risk due to uh, the eruption. And we got extra funding for this uh, project from the Ministry of Education and, and Culture. Uh, just to give you some uh, uh, context, the scheduled monuments are, uh, are the highest form of protection of ar archaeological sites in Iceland. So this is the, uh, the highest form of, of uh, protection by our uh, cultural heritage law. Uh, just to give you uh, an idea of the area in question, uh, this map shows part of the south coast of the Reykjanes Peninsula. You can see the outlines of the lava flow in orange as it looked uh, like at the end of the eruption uh, in September last year. Uh, the black and white icons with the letter R uh, are scheduled and protected sites, archaeological sites. And finally, the 3D uh, icons you can see there uh, mark the scheduled site we managed to record using uh, 3D technology. Uh, even though as you can see on this map, uh, the lava never reached the scheduled sites, however, but two of them were at risk during the eruptions. And these were uh, the ones at the bottom here uh, on the right, Selatangar and Húsholmi. Uh, but in addition, Selatangar uh, site is situated on the coastline and is therefore under constant risk uh, due to coastal erosion. So we decided also to add a third uh, site to our project, even though it wasn't in danger at the time. Uh, and you can see it, it's quite far away from the, from the lava flow and, and the actual eruption site. It's uh, over there, it says outlaw encampment. Uh, but this uh, site is located very close to another volcanic uh, system in the peninsula called Svartsengi. And you can see the crater row, uh, you have the name of the crater row there, Eldvörth, on the map. Uh, but just to give you an information about like how, uh, how active uh, the volcanic systems are in the peninsula, just last month, uh, we had waves of earthquakes in this particular area of Eldvörth, and very close, and just where we have our uh, scheduled uh, monument site there. Uh, and specialists detected an uplift, so the land had risen uh, last month 40 to 45 millimeters. And uh, like I said, we need to be very alert uh, about this, uh, uh, this type of, of natural disasters. Uh, 
um, regarding our uh, health sites. Um, and uh, just to tell you as well, the last uh, series of eruptions uh, were 800 years ago in, uh, in Iceland, in this uh, area, and it lasted for uh, about 30 years. And so specialists are saying now that uh, maybe now a, a new, uh, the time has come for a new uh, type of, uh, for a new series of, of uh, eruptions. Uh, these three sites are unique for various reasons. At Selatangar, we have uh, well-preserved archaeological remains uh, of fishing station with fishermen's huts, stables, fish shelters, uh, approximately of 20 ruins, along with uh, several stone walls and caves, uh, all representing a long history of fishing in Iceland and bear witness of the people living there uh, seasonally in the past. Uh, the ruins are in the middle of an ancient lava field formed by a volcanic eruption in 1150 AD. And uh, the site was uh, occupied somewhat after this period, uh, but always used as a fishing station and never as a uh, functioned as a uh, permanent residence. And the last fishing season there uh, was actually in the 19th century, 1884. Site number two is Husholme. Uh, there are ruins of a Viking Age longhouse along with the church and other structures uh, related to the settlement. And this site is also located uh, in the middle of the lava field from 12th century AD. But unlike at Selatankar, people were actually living there prior to the volcanic eruption. And when you visit the site, you can see how the lava somehow embraces uh, these ruins. Uh, it is quite a unique site because of this uh, entanglement with Mother Nature. And you can see it, uh, there's an aerial photo there, uh, who saw me from above. And you can see uh, all the, the light colored landscape. This is all lava with uh, moss and the green is where the ruins are located. Uh, the third site uh, consists of numerous small stone-made huts and fox traps uh, hidden in a hollow in the lava field east of the crater row Eldver. Uh, and uh, because of their remote location, the site is believed to have been an outlaw encampment or used as a hideout for the citizens of Grindavik uh, when, uh, yeah, during an invasion of pirates in 1627. Another theory is that the huts were used by fox hunters, which is a kind of a, a not as a, a fun uh, theory. <laughs> uh, now it took us uh, a little bit about the yeah the methodology. I'm not going to go into all the details of the of the technical aspect of it, but it took us five long working days to finish documenting these sites uh, where the fishing station at Selatangar took most of our time. Uh, the weather conditions uh, were not in our favor every day, so as it was sometimes windy and, and uh, raining on and off. Uh, and it was also the largest, largest area we had to, uh, had to cover, approximately 260 by 90 meters. Uh, but we ended uh, up taking 3,500 images uh, just from this site, uh, both from the air with a drone and ground photos uh, using tripods. And we used the photogrammetry method uh, and set up a grid for the drone to fly in, uh, systematic systematically taking photos every few seconds. Uh, also, we spread out markers uh, all, all around the area in question and coordinates taken with the GPS uh, on each of the markers. Uh, this was, of course, for the processing work uh, afterwards, which uh, uh, was made completely by Dag Event at NICU. He did all the, all the processing of the data we collected in, in, on the field so, and uh, created uh, to create the, the 3D models. Uh, yeah, in total, I mean, we took 8,400 images uh, in all of these three sites. 
And uh, yeah, I think what, how many did you take not last in your, in the big project, you had 70,000 photos. I thought 8,400 was a lot, so. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, the main benefits of the project is without a doubt that we managed to preserve these sites in uh, three dimensional models for future generations. Uh, and uh, both for the public to enjoy and explore online and, and to be used for uh, also research purposes. Uh, yeah, and uh, I just want to say, I mean, obviously uh, for us, I don't know what's happening with the, the logo. This is very strange. This was not like that before. Anyways, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, yeah, I mean, obviously uh, we were lucky this time because no, none of the of the sites were swallowed by lava flow this time around. Uh, but I mean, that was the purpose of our trip to, to get as much uh, uh, data from these sites uh, in this uh, digital uh, approach. And, uh, and that was, uh, of course, yeah. So that was a, a kind of the main benefit of the project uh, for us, at, at least this time, and uh, hopefully uh, it, they will be safe, but uh, uh, but I mean this is a very efficient approach of documenting documenting sites that are uh, in imminent threat, especially due to climate ch change as well. And uh, we have, uh, uh, of course, a lot of of these sites in Iceland. Uh, but in this case, of course, the volcanic activity. Um, Another benefit is like what I saw, like when we were walking every day for five days back and forth through lava fields and rough landscapes, uh, long distances. Uh, I realized that this type of documentation would also be beneficial in terms of uh, engaging uh, with an audience that can possibly never visit these sites. Uh, accessibility is very poor uh, for people with any walking disabilities. And, uh, and like I said, we have, there are so many sites like that in Iceland. Uh, uh, the, these archaeological sites are usually never just by the road. Uh, you kind of have to walk, walk maybe also through the, uh, the rough landscape. And uh, yeah, so, uh, and lastly, I mean, with this great experience working with uh, Niku, we at the Cultural Heritage Agency have expanded our uh, knowledge in digital documentation and uh, we have also now created a new platform uh, to reach out uh, to a wider uh, digital uh, audience. Um, yeah, and so... Um, for all these reasons, uh, it is our hope to continue this on this 3D journey and focus on documenting and uh, presenting to the public other scheduled uh, monuments that are endangered by any kind of uh, natural disasters. Uh, we have about 850 scheduled monuments in Iceland, so there are a few to choose from. Uh, but hey, we did three in five days, so <laughs> I am optimistic about the future. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, thanks to thanks to Nico and uh, especially Dag Öwind for uh, for a great collaboration, we managed to create uh, th uh, 10 3D models. So that I would like to show you a little bit. Here you can see, uh, yeah, you can see us walking with uh, Dag with his uh, 10 kilo drone and uh, in his rubber boots through the. <laughs> Through the, through the lava fields in the Reykjanes Peninsula. Okay, I'm gonna try now to just end with uh, showing you uh, some of our models that we managed uh, to create. I think it's easiest to go like that. Right. Yes, of course. Um, so obviously you're saying at the end that the threat to the heritage was kind of like the imminent. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and and then we yeah, and so this is kind of uh, one of our measures that we took in uh, in 
yeah, in our attempt to preserve these sites as deep as, uh, yeah, in a more detailed way than we have done before. I mean, obviously we have uh, been using uh, uh, GPS and, and uh, I mean, drone photos and all of this and some videos, but we wanted to, to do this in a, in a more kind of detailed way. So, do you have any plans then? You're saying that you know it's great for research and, and having the digitization and for documentation. Mm -hmm. Do you have any plans then for the future of the summit uh, beyond uh, kind of preserving and, and keeping it as a record? I mean, that was our main goal for this kind of uh, specific uh, project, but we haven't thought it uh, in, a, in a more kind of uh, to use it for research specifically, but uh, I mean it's open and uh, anybody can uh, and anybody can use it in their own uh, research, whether it's about cultural landscapes or movement of of people within uh, in uh, in uh, yeah in this type of landscape or any landscape studies or, or whatever. I mean, but we haven't thought about uh, doing any specific kind of uh, research with these models but we wanna this is more uh, because I'm yeah it's I'm working in the administration and this is more kind of, of finding uh, good and uh, better uh, methods of, of preserving the sites in some kind of a form obviously obviously I don't think that the 3d is better than the real thing and but I mean this is what we can do now and and we should and, and therefore we should do it like because this technology exists and it, it is also kind of our uh, responsibility to to uh, try to at least preserve them in some way before uh, before coast uh, the the sea will sweep them away or or any volcano will uh, take over the the whole area but i just want to show you i hope you maybe just uh, if there's anybody online, it's better just to go maybe on Sketchfab and, and find our models there and look through them. But uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a glimpse. Obviously, we're using Sketchfab. Some people may, might not like it, but I quite like it. It's quite simple and uh, it's very uh, easy to, to find it online for anybody who's just searching for any type of uh, 3D or, or heritage sites or, or whatever. So. Uh, yeah, we managed to create 10 uh, models, three quite large ones and, and uh, seven smaller, more detailed ones of, of the, the ruins. So, uh, of course, Getsfab doesn't give you uh, a lot of kind of uh, uh, space for any text. <clears throat> but, I mean, we tried to put as much text as we could just to give some uh, context about the sites and what people are, are looking at. So let's see how it's okay. It's quite heavy. This is the, the model that took uh, most of our time. The uh, Selatankar. But yeah, I mean, you know the basics. I'm not going to go into any details about just using uh, the mouse. And of course, we have. You can zoom in. This is a more uh, the more rough model, but if you want to go into uh, the smaller ones, it's very easy. But yeah, we try to put uh, for every site. Of course, we put both in Icelandic and English just a little bit of info uh, about the area or the site or the or the ruin. So this is just a basic kind of 3D. You can just zoom in and out and play around with it a little bit. Uh, we also, yeah, so there's always a little text um, and then, let me see if. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. I was just wondering because the last two models are covered in moss, mm -hmm. and I know that's quite fragile. Are you scared that if the Parabas use models and they're going to go, they might start going there 
Yeah, I mean, that can always happen. I mean, uh, that is... Uh, I mean, like this one that I'm just opening the outlaw encampment, it's quite uh, hidden. Uh, and we, I mean, obviously, we don't want too many tourists going over there because of it's very, like you say, the moss is quite fragile. So, I mean, this is also, uh, yeah, maybe uh, kind of a, a red flag, like if, if people start to maybe go there in like 300 people a day or something then might we might take them down the <laughs> from our <laughs> website but uh, i don't want to worry about this just yet uh, i think we just have to deal with it if, when the time comes yeah so so yeah but i just want to show you lastly here the we have some annotations as well like uh okay was it not this one maybe it was some other one yeah, anyways, we are uh, we are thinking of uh, adding a little bit more annotations to uh, to the models, but uh, but you can see Obstra. Do you have any? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much. Hope you all go after tonight and go and look at all of our beautiful models. <laughs> nice. I'll just take a note here. I think um, if we go back to schedule, then I'll play the video and then. I don't know if we're here. Yeah, I, to, I think my presentation has a lot of animations in it, so it might be quite hefty. So can we start downloading, downloading it first? Online. Yeah. That's also, fine. they look a bit strange, the logos there. I don't know yeah. why. The way, no. I'm sure it didn't look like that no. when you made it. Yeah, we'll see. So let's um, go back, Alison. Hello, everyone. My name is Christian Koch Madsen. I am the Deputy Director of Greenland National Museum and Archives. I'm very sorry that I wasn't able to join the conference in real time, either um, digitally or uh, actually in Reykjavik, which I would have loved to, but I was unfortunately prevented. But I do want to extend my thanks to Schooly for inviting me and um, for taking a few minutes of your time to tell you a little bit about digital heritage in Greenland some of our experiences, initiatives, and the challenges we associate with this field in museum work. Now, before I provide some concrete examples of how we've been working with digital heritage, I just wanted to provide you with a little bit of background and baseline for understanding how and why we are working as we are. Greenland National Museum and Archives is a central institution for cultural and natural heritage resource management in Greenland, including, of course, public outreach and dissemination. We attempt to do so with a 16 to 18 person academic staff serving a population of only 56,000 people, which are dispersed in towns and settlements along the coast of most of the country. We are essentially attempting to monitor a coastline of 44,000 kilometers and a ice-free area of 410,000 square kilometers. Now, this is not a big place compared to many other big countries, but what is really, you know, the problem here is that we have very little developed physical infrastructure, meaning that none of these cities are connected by land and you have to travel by boat or plane to get there, making it very difficult and expensive. The internet infrastructure is also very poorly developed once you get out of the cities. So when you are away from the cities and settlements, there's often no internet connection. And even in the settlements and cities, there can be very poor connection and it's unstable and very expensive. So this create some challenges in terms of sort of the digital outreach that we have to be constantly aware of. But at the same time, we have to try to attempt to be a national museum for the entire country. So one of the first 
initiatives we had to start sharing our data and making it publicly available was the NUNIFIT, our online heritage site database, uh, where you can, in a very simple way, go in and see the locations of all our registered sites. In, in most cases, you can then also draw up some data, some PDFs with uh, information around the site from old reports, handbooks, field diaries, excavation reports, and, uh, and download them as well. This, of, of course, was our, one of our first attempts to make the data we have more accessible to the public and scholars, but also serving administration, so different authorities across Greenland, which would save some time for us because they would otherwise contact us directly with these questions which they can now at least in part answer by going through this portal. We will look of cons of this service which is rather expensive to keep running. Uh, the license cost, the hosting and the updating and very recently um, we had to change the system because we were running into maintain issues with maintaining such an old system and also it's very ill-fitted for new developments across the government of Greenland. Another more recent attempt to make data accessible is our Anagorg platform where you can access archival records and imagery which are found in our collections. This has become extremely popular because of the general interest in gene genealogy so many people will go in and search the digitized church records for entries about their family, their birthplace, and so forth. It's of course an attempt to make this data accessible to both public and scholars, but it also saves us um, some time on the administration because previously people would ask us to find this uh, information, but now they can do them it's, uh, themselves online. On the current side, it's also an expensive service with license cost hosting and updating issues constantly presenting themselves. Now making collections digitally accessible is a course, a challenge in itself and something that we have been exploring as well. So in 2017, we had a really good team of student helpers on the museum who started their own process a project called Esesano, uh, which basically had the idea to digitally reunite a collection that has been dispersed between Greenland, Denmark, and uh, New York. So through photogrammetry, they wanted to 3D model uh, the key artifacts in this collection and then essentially reunite them digitally. Now, on the, looking to the pros, it was a student-run project, which means it had very low costs. And it had a great deal of uh, early in energy and initiative as the students um, worked very hard on this project. And it also gave it a good exposure on social media because they are, of course, the expert users. On the bad side, as a project matured, we realized that it was very difficult to keep the momentum as some students were finishing up and getting other jobs and had difficulties attracting new students. They also ran into a lot of technical issues in finding cheap hosting and also in storing the data and securing the data so it would not be misused by other users. Now, if you want to see other examples of these great models where they took particularly care in working with the texture and the color of the objects, you can uh, follow this link to Sketchfab where you can explore the artifacts uh, on your own. One of our most recent attempts with working with digital heritage is, is um, an attempt to reach stakeholders and authorities across the country to basically help us preserve Greenland's cultural and natural heritage. In order to do so, we've been working with this platform called Articular 360, which is um, a platform made for designing and carrying out courses and it's used by several universities in the US. The benefits of a system like this is it's a very smooth system with many pre-designed features for teaching. So you can add questionnaires, small tests and feedback, uh, which allows us to have some kind of um, responses from our users. On the con side, it does come with some license cost. And if you want nice audiovisual elements to make it more understandable, just require a graphic designer. And also if you really want to have the maximum output of the 
um, functionalities of the program, you need a experienced user. So in this case, we had to turn to external consultants in setting up the system. We are very interested in exploring and uh, testing how we can become better at engaging with the public uh, across the entire country so we become a national institution in uh, its true meaning. And one way we've been doing this is with the ESRI story mapping platform, which is sort of a good way of integrating data into um, to a map-based approach. And a concrete example is the Asivisio at community story mapping project, which was carried out as part of a um, research project called Activating Arctic Heritage, which is a collaboration between the Greenlandic and Danish national museums. Now, the team of um, this project went into the settlement here, and then they found at the local museum some old tape recordings with caribou hunters from the 60s and 70s describing of how they used the landscape particular places, place names, and a lot of other highly relevant information. We then uh, following me went in and digitized and translated all of this, uh, all of these recordings. We added on a spin-off project where we had kids do drawings or the, their experiences of going caribou hunting with their families and adding it all to this map-based platform where you can explore points in the landscape. You can integrate the different visuals and add you know, various kinds of data, the sound files, and different uh, old videos, and many other things. Now, in a project like this, it's uh, you of course have some license costs, and then in our case, and with our internet infrastructure, we soon realize that we have to, you know, make sure it doesn't become too data heavy. This is just drawing data from the cloud. As once you start to add a lot of data, uh, the, the interface becomes very slow and then you lose a lot of the users. So something to constantly be aware of, aware of. There's also some concerns about the data storage, which is a highly important historic data that we want to uh, preserve for the future. And um, we're dealing a little bit with how we should do this, including all the metadata that makes it relevant. And finally, we are also a little bit uncertain whether we are reaching the right users with this project. So we know it's highly popular with people coming in from the outside and researchers, and many of you would probably also enjoy it, but we are not sure that the people in the local area are actually finding it useful. Can the teachers use it uh, for teaching? Are the, the, the hunters going in to learn about the old stories and all that? So that's something also to think about. Now, as you have heard in other presentations, or will hear, uh, we now have new digital technologies um, that will help us in our heritage management. And not at least drones and photogrammetry have become a standard uh, tool within archaeology and heritage management. It has provided us with a very time efficient and precise tool um, to create 3D models of various sites across the landscape which you can go in and explore yourself. You can turn around, flip in and out, zoom, add and remove layers. So it is really a great tool also for visual presentation, at least to some users. Again, we realize that many uh, sort of everyday users will have a limited interest in these kinds of models that um, are also very uh, data heavy, which means that with our internet infrastructure, they are not as accessible as we could hope for. There are other issues with these new um, technologies. Again, you need license, the equipment is fairly expensive, and the post processing programs are expensive. And not at least with the new technology, we are producing immense amounts of data which for museums will create the issue of how to store up, back up, and secure the data for the future, both in terms of metadata and file formats. To conclude this presentation on digital heritage work, I wanted to summarize and provide some overall perspectives here from Greenland. We, of course, realize the potentials in the new technologies and platforms 
which allows us to reach various types of users and audiences, public and academic of all ages, in all agreement and beyond. We also have experienced how the technologies can facilitate a more inclusive approach to heritage management and research by basically involving the stakeholders and users directly and creating the ownership to the heritage, which I believe we are all aspiring to. The new te technologies also provide tools that can ease and improve our heritage workflows from the field in, into the um, place in the collections if we give some consideration to how we are working. Now we are keenly following the development of the field um, because it has been growing exponentially since um, the emergence of te digital technologies in museum work and can only um, increase in the future. Now, there's also some challenges associated with the field that we are also becoming more and more aware of, especially as we are a small museum. And some of the things that we always think about is how do we sustain digital heritage projects and for how long? They're very easy to fund in the beginning, uh, but they are costly to keep running and a lot more difficult to fund in the long run. You often need um, to draw in specialists with a particular uh, knowledge about a certain program or platform. How do we or do we need to preserve the data from the digital projects? There's all kinds of concerns in this regard. It's what kind of data formats and metadata are we leaving for the future? How do we store it and the increasing amount of data that we are producing? And leading to the basic question of defining what is actually a successful digital heritage project. Is it one with many users? But are these users foreign or domestic? Is it a project with a long life but few active users? Is it a project that improves our outreach or alleviates museum tasks and so forth? So to conclude, as a small museum at least, we always explore and critically consider the right and sustainable digital heritage, heritage projects and address and think about whether the impact usability of ways, the costs and the preservation considerations that we need to have. And with these words, I would like to thank you for your time and I hope we can continue these discussions about developing sustainable and useful digital heritage projects in the future. Thank you. Is there a discussion? I mean, you can't ask a question, but you can certainly make I a comment, I guess. I, I worked on some of the illustrations. Yeah. The presentation that I didn't realize we were going to be in there. So if anyone has specifically any questions about the tent circle, <laughs> <laughs> I can help other than that. The seal skins. How did you make the seal skin? Um, well, I think those are really good points, especially from smaller museums, because I know like with us, we've come up against those. Um, and, you know, if anybody has any solutions, those are always something that's kind of uh, I think kind of project-based and also organizationally based. And one, one all, you know, one band-aid doesn't fix all. Um, but I think it's, I don't know, for me, it's building relationships um, where, you know, if the project, yes, you might get funded for a project um, and it might have an ending date. And obviously we're seeing that with some projects uh, here with then fallout with Brexit is that then maybe the next funding call you're not involved and that's actually have has been a bit of a danger for for a threat to to some of them but if you can keep a relationship going and keep then going for projects and keep it alive because usually then that one project isn't you know you did it you did it but also what else can you do with it maybe you develop more but i don't know if anybody has any comments on that but if not we'll move on if you want to do Alice, let's see. Definitely download and then I'll download mine. And then now the camera's been here, so go ahead. Go ahead. Sit. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Better president for sitting now, so <laughs> might as well. Um, 
Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Alice. Uh, I'm currently working as a lecturer in communication design at Duncan of Johnston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee in Scotland. Um, although I'm actually moving to Iceland later this year. Um, so in terms of my background, I am an archaeologist and reconstruction artist. Um, and my research area is really in science communication and public outreach for uh, archaeology and heritage. So as well as working on the kind of more traditional artist impressions um, and, and kind of reconstruction work in that sense. Um, over the past couple of years, I've also been very focused on working with indigenous communities and stakeholders um, in the circumpolar north. So across Alaska, uh, Canada and also Greenland. Um, and this work really centers around the ways that we can engage communities with their local archaeology and heritage um, in a way really which is relevant um, and kind of meaningful for them today. So similar to, to a lot of the things that Christian was just talking about. Um, so my talk today is really centered around this question of how we might use methods in uh, visual media to include local communities and stakeholders in science and heritage communication. Um, so very much thinking from a community archaeology perspective on themes of co-design and multivocality, um, representing rural communities and maybe you know voices that don't always get heard. And um, so in particular, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of my work with the Nunathlik archaeology project um, up in Alaska. Um, so just to give you a very, very quick um, introduction to the project, um, the Nunathlik project is a collaboration between archaeologists from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland um, and the native village of Quinnahawk in Alaska. And over, I think, around the past kind of 12 or 13 years, um, the project has focused around the excavations of a pre-contact Yupik sod house, which is what you can see here, um, pre-contact being before European and Russian colonizers um, arrived. So I think at last count were somewhere, something ridiculous, like 100,000 artifacts have been excavated from this site. And today it's the largest and most internationally significant collection to have ever been excavated in Alaska. And quite amazingly, the collection is held in the community in the local culture center and this is a community of about 700 people so it's, it's quite amazing um, and elders and people with the community help us interpret a lot of the artifacts um, particularly in the case of the hunting tools because there's a lot of modern parallels because people still practice a largely subsistence-based lifestyle in Quinnahawk today um, so there's this kind of real sense of shared process and shared discovery with the local community um, and the ethos um, certainly from the project directors, is that a project like this um, really has to meet the local needs, not just the scientific needs. And this means making joint decisions on how to approach the archaeological site, um, dealing with the artifacts and the kind of overall interpretation. So the narrative that we're putting out to the wider public, and that's um, kind of where, where I come in. Um, so I joined the project um, back in 2017 um, to lead design of the Nunathlik educational resource, so basically an, an interactive computer programme, um, which was primarily aimed at uh, an Indigenous school age audience, so kids from kind of quite a wide age range, um, actually kind of from like seven up. Uh, really in, in the, the local school. And the idea here was that we were bringing together um, kind of scientific knowledge, traditional knowledge and uh, contemporary lived experiences. So of course, historically, um, as, as we all know, indigenous peoples around the world have um, really been afforded very little agency um, in the practices of archeology span and uh, ethnography. So, in that sense, my challenge here was to create visual work which was responsive and, and aware of this kind of societal context um, to ensure that the story of the archaeology was told in a way which was relevant to the community in Quinnahawk today. So fundamentally, the idea that, you know, people should recognize themselves in representations of their cultural heritage. 
Um, so following a series of uh, kind of focus groups with the local community um, and the Board of Village Elders, um, which is just as intimidating as it sounds. <laughs> um, so that was during that kind of first summer season in Quinnahawk. Um, we were able to lock down the interface design uh, for the resource, which was designed around this kind of central reconstruction um, of the sod house that we've been excavating at Nunafik. And users can then explore inside so they can um, kind of number one up there you can go inside the sod house and explore a couple of rooms that we've excavated but you can also go to uh, scenes in the wider landscape so we have um, you can go out on a dog sled on the ice um, you can go on a kayak on the sea and you can go out to a seasonal camp on the tundra um, and of course you can also go to the uh, culture center um, in Quinnahawk today which is kind of the archaeology hub um, of the village so um, with this and kind of co-designing the resource with the community, um, I really wanted to explore how multivocality in outreach material um, could be used to um, really bring more balance to um, kind of different experiences, different types of knowledge um, and worldviews of um, an archaeological investigation, so an archaeological dig. Um, from contemporary traditional scientific perspectives. Um, so the result was this kind of interactive program, um, which allows the users to explore the reconstruction and also explore it in the landscape. But um, that's paired with audio insights, um, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, 3D artifacts as well, of course, from a collection with 100,000 artifacts, we scanned um, as many as we could, um, which is not very many in the grand scheme of things. But, um, and it also has, kind of interactive diagrams um, and a couple of kind of very, very basic games. Um, so the resource, as I said, has kind of been designed around this idea of um, using oral storytelling, um, which is really the core method still today of kind of uh, traditionally sharing knowledge in uh, Yupik communities. And so the idea with the resources kind of rather than, you know, reading these big blocks of kind of anonymous text, instead you're hearing from all of these different voices and, and all of these different perspectives. So, for example, we have the Quinnahog elders and culture bearers who are this, this invaluable pool of uh, traditional knowledge. We have master carvers, uh, craftspeople and contemporary artists who help us understand how a lot of the artifacts that we uncover were made and how they were used. Um, we've got the young people in the community, um, many of whom are kind of really exploring and kind of defining and in some cases actually redefining their relationship with their heritage. So particularly through um, the resurgence of kind of traditional dance um, in the community. Um, we have the archaeologists you know, obviously, but even within the archaeologists, there's so many different specialisms and kind of research areas. So the, those are kind of coming into it as well. Um, and then we have students and volunteers. So people coming in internationally for the dig in the summer, um, but also people coming down from the village to dig uh, with us. So kind of international and local. And many of them are just experiencing field work for the first time and kind of the, the wonders that, <laughs> that unfold with that. Um, so this idea of kind of creating balance and um, equity, I suppose, through the multivocal audio and the resource was really, really important and kind of core to the project, but it wasn't the only place that Indigenous perspectives were represented, kind of alongside the archaeological narratives. Um, they also really strongly influenced um, the kind of overall resource design and um, the approach to content curation. So something that came out really clearly in the co-design sessions and feedback sessions with the community was that they, they'd say, we don't want our heritage presented in a glass case museum. You know, we're a living culture and we want that to be represented here. Um, so rather than kind of having the 3D artifacts um, presented in more of a kind of ordered assemblage or typology like you might have in a museum, um, instead, they're encountered kind of as part of the exploration as you go around the house, so you can kind of, um, you know, pick things up, but they're muddled in with the kind of chaos of, of daily life at Nunathlik. So if I clicked on one of the objects, it's kind of variously highlighting in the scene there. Um, so this is a Uluak from the site, so it's a slate knife, and you can see um, it's got a really beautiful handle that's kind of shaped like a seal. 
Um, so the example here, you're able to bring up the 3D model um, of the ULU, um, but then you've got these little sound bite icons down the side. So you can hear, I think on this one, we've got um, Willard Church talking about um, how he learned to make ULUs from uh, his grandmother and how she kind of passed down those skills. Um, we've got one of the archaeologists, um, I think Edward, possibly, um, on this one talking about stable isotope analysis of the hair that we find on site. So we know what people were eating, so we know what people were cutting, um, you know, cutting fish and, and other things with these tools. Um, and then we've also got, um, you know, the perspective from a younger person in the community who's just talking about kind of cutting fish at summer camp with her family. So kind of um, you know, multivocality and co-curation on this kind of bringing a much uh, richer representation to the objects and more balance to the kind of interpretation and how we're curating these uh, these digital scans. Um, so very quickly with my final few slides, um, I want to introduce a project that we're currently working on. Um, this is a follow on project uh, that's also funded by the uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. Um, and this is to develop the uh, Nunathlet Digital Museum and Catalogue, um, which will be um, kind of an online community co-curated exhibition on one side and a more traditional kind of catalogue on the other side. Um, and this, whereas the educational resource is obviously aimed at kids, this is kind of aimed at grown-ups and kind of everybody. Um, so, you know, that, that audience is kind of made up from um, Indigenous peoples, of course, um, researchers and a kind of wider global public as well. So um, quite broad. Um, and really, I mean, for uh, us on this project, I think this follow-on funding grant is quite exciting because in writing the proposal, I mean, we were just talking about kind of sustained collaboration with the same community, right? So in writing this proposal, we were really able to look back at what we did with the educational resource and say, well, you know, what could we do better here? What would we change if we were gonna kind of develop things forward? Um, and in particular, um, we're ensuring on this project that um, not only are the local community members part of the advisory board and part of those voices that are kind of coming together on this, but we um, were really keen to also include um, kind of UPIC creatives on the production and design team as well in a kind of more present way than we were able to do on the educational resource because that was quite a small focus project. So, um, so I'll give you a couple of examples. So I won't dwell on this too much because it just looks a little bit boring. <laughs> so uh, kind of looking at the catalogue, first of all, um, with this project, obviously we're serving a very broad audience um, from local community to academics. So it's really important to kind of consider the ways that people might access the information in the catalogue. Um, so this is the back end of the catalogue. The final thing won't look like this, but this is what we're kind of currently working with. Um, and it shows how we're including um, different search categories that are not only based on the normal things that you might kind of think of as an archeologist, so looking at materials and things like that, but also looking at um, kind of defining the objects more in the way that people in the local community talk about them. So thinking about how you might be able to search the collection based on activity or based on place and, and things like that. Um, so this is some uh, kind of very early stage concept development uh, for this project. Um, and this is kind of the more digital exhibition side of things. Um, and this will connect with the catalog. So the two will, will kind of talk to each other. But the idea here is um, the interface is based around, you know, you get those kind of panoramic maps at like ski resorts or uh, I guess kind of national parks and things that give more of a sense of being in the landscape. So it's not just kind of a top down view, you get a sense of the, the kind of experience of being there. Um, and the idea here is that you can kind of scroll through the seasons and then different activities will appear that you can click on and that will take you to reconstructed um, scenes of activity that kind of link with uh, Nunathlik and, and the archaeology project and what we can kind of find out about that. Um, so for this, this has been really fun because obviously the project started during COVID and it's only recently that we've been able to get back out to Alaska. So I was out there a couple of weeks ago, but in the meantime, while I was working on this material, I was working really closely with uh, Jackie Cleveland, who's an incredible photographer um, who lives and grew up in Quinnahawk. 
And she was sharing photographs from different times of year with me and kind of curating a collection of images that I could then use when I started to develop the concept art and think about the color palettes that I was using and the types of landscape and scenery that we could tie to the um, archeological reconstructions. Um, there's only so much sketching I can do kind of when I'm out in Quinnahawk and I'm usually there one time of year rather than another. Um, so that kind of relationship was really nice. And also, I mean, Jackie grew up there. She knows this landscape better than anyone. She's a creator, she's a photographer. So her photographs really kind of bring that essence of place, which I think is, is really important for this type of work. Um, so this is an example of one of the kind of reconstructed scenes that would pop out. So if you had um, something kind of hunting on spring ice um, is the idea here. So you'd have the reconstructed scene and then um, we're thinking a, a kind of interpretation panel that can come up from the side. Um, so we've got things like um, this little, um, it's just a, a kind of prototype that um, I uh, kind of made up in uh, just using Sketchfab. Um, we're gonna uh, program our own kind of version of this, but um, Generally, I've been doing a lot of 3D scanning of the collection and 3D scans are fantastic, right? Because, you know, artists uh, are able to kind of really examine uh, di different uh, pieces from the collection. Uh, researchers are, are able to do the same. Um, but I always like to think about, well, what could we do that's a little bit further on from just the scan itself? So the idea here is that we can take um, you know, the kind of harpoon heads that we find from site and the fragments of the shaft of the harpoon, and then we can reconstruct the missing parts and then we can put it in context on the kayak and then you can kind of pull it apart and then explore different elements of it. It's kind of what, what we're thinking with there. Um, the other element that we're trying to develop um, much more on this project is integrating the UPIC language um, in, in a better way. We did in the educational resource, we were able to name things um, and name artifacts, but we're working with um, Lonnie Strunk, who also is, um, he's in his early 20s and uh, is also from Quinnahawk and has a really interesting area. So he's a computer programmer, but he's also a UPIC linguist. So he's working with us to be able to do things like um, integrate kind of language elements so you can click on different phrasings and then um, see the UPIC words, but also see how they're used in a sentence, um, which is really important for a lot of the young people in the community. Can It's a bit like how I'm learning Icelandic. I can name things, <laughs> but trying to use things in a sentence and think about grammar and, and stuff like that. So we're working with Lonnie really closely on, on those kind of elements and also to be able to hear things as well. Um, so uh, yeah, kind of looking forward to uh, where we are now. Um, we have a, a Facebook page set up for the local community this summer and um, we're running a series of workshops. This is another way that we're kind of trying to um, work with the community as part of this co-design process. So we're running workshops that um, are focused on themes that people have expressed interest in. So um, obviously we're gonna have another dance workshop with uh, the kids, which we did um, as part of the education pack um, as well. But this time we're gonna be looking at kind of making traditional drums and um, we'll have a subsistence workshop and also something that's kind of looking at jewelry and clothing. So again, that idea of keeping things relevant tied to the archeological projects, but keeping things relevant to what the community is in, interested in today. Um, so I'm almost certain I've run out of time. So <laughs> I'm on my last slide here. Um, so just to kind of finish with, with a final thought, um, I think for archeologists and scientists, it can be really challenging sometimes to make the research engaging and relevant for the broader communities that we work in. And I think we often kind of default to interpretations of the past, which function on dates and measurements and, and analysis and things. But, people often relate to their past in, in much more personal and emotive ways, um, almost kind of utilizing their heritage as this contemporary cultural resource. And multivocality and, and co-curation, particularly on this project, um, you know, it, it's started to kind of bring fresh insights to the objects and helps the archeology span project forge, um, you know, new relationships with these wider communities that it serves. But I think for me, 
working on these projects over the last couple of years, it's really also reinforced that multivocality, I suppose, is the design methodology. Um, it, it's a two way street. So it doesn't just mean kind of inviting everyone to participate, um, you know, kind of supplementing an established narrative with, with extra voices, but it means being really willing to listen and to adapt and kind of, um, yeah, respond as the project unfolds. And in some cases kind of kill your darlings and, and accept that some things aren't working kind of work along. So that's, um, if you want to find out more about the archeology span project, there's a project blog there. If you want to email me, um, I think my Dundee address will be active for very much longer, but um, that's my email address there. And if you want to download the educational resource, it's available for Mac and PC and it runs on the desktop, the internet's rubbish in the village. So we have it as kind of a downloadable executable. You can uh, install it there. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's very practical. Thank you so much. So interesting. And it's so beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, big fan of the today's Yes. I, I just want to, because it sounds such a lot of work, because I know that directing sites, and I mean, just to direct the sites and just have a few uh, guides, like guided tours and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, uh, how much time do you spend out like in the field and I mean how how much time of the part of the year are you yeah. actually working on all of the things that you mentioned that yeah. it sounds just like a whole year uh, project. It was it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah so we're we're quite a small team as well so it's mostly um me and we've got a, a programmer that I was working with. So I do kind of the interaction design and then hand things over to him to kind of make the, the buttons work and, and things like that. Um, so it's kind of the two of us working on that. And then I've spent quite a bit of time out in Quinnahawk pre-COVID <laughs> when we were still able yes, to travel. Yes. So the first year I was out there for about a month. And then the next year I came back and was out for three months. And that was when I did all of the interviews with people in the community and kind of ran some workshops and things with the archaeologists. Um, so it's really just, I mean, it's difficult as well because most of the time when we're out in the summer, it's the height of subsistence season. So if it's a good day, everyone will disappear and be out fishing. <laughs> so it's kind of, you need to be there for a long time and, and things. So, and now that we're able to travel again um, on the development of the new project, as I said, we were doing... Um, and kind of a, a lot of Skype calls every couple of weeks to kind of feedback with the people that we're working with. Um, but it was out for two weeks um, last month, uh, mostly scanning things. And I'm, I managed to scan 206 objects in six days. Wow. I'm just very happy. <laughs> so I set myself a goal of 100. And usually I try and lower expectations. No one ever tries to raise expectations. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so I was out for two weeks. And then um, in a month's time, I'm going back out for kind of four or five weeks again to run these workshops and then probably back out again in October, which isn't very environmentally friendly doing so many trips up to Alaska, but we can do what we have to do. <laughs> so um, yeah, so as much time as we can in the field, but it's very, very intensive periods of kind of data collection and, and working with people. So yeah, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well done. Uh, let's see. Who is next? Uh, well, I know I'm next, but who is then after? I'll go ahead download. Which ones haven't we done? Because I'll just do. Uh, I'll do Maria's. I'll just download them in the background. And story tagging. Download and. So basically, we have forty five minutes. So I will do my best to rip through my, my presentation as well. Is this one mine? It is mine. Okay. I'll keep myself accountable. All right. So. Hmm. That's weird. 
How did that happen? Oh yeah, resume, resume share. Where is it? Oh, resume share. That's odd. Maybe it's because I went full screen. I don't know. I mean, we don't have to go full screen, but you just won't get the cool spinny objects. It's fun. Right. Try it again. Hey, computers. <laughs> I in a digital heritage, computer science. It's mm, that's how it is. Um, okay, so I introduced myself earlier, but again, I'm Catherine and Cassie. I'm from the University of St. Andrews. Um, I work with the Open Virtual Worlds uh, research team, and we're an interdisciplinary team uh, that works with emergent technologies to uh, represent, to preserve, to promote heritage. Um, we work a lot in Scotland itself, but also part of multinational um, projects that I'll kind of mention a little bit because what I'm going to speak about today are strategies in which help empower the communities themselves to build up their uh, digital resiliency um, through preservation and promotion um, of their heritage, specifically using 3D. So and <laughs> Alice went first because it kind of like brings you in thinking about 3D itself. So um, anyway, so these strategies were developed uh, through multiple projects, but it had a wonderful, well, okay, I'm not going to say wonderful. It had a use case of COVID, um, which to prove resiliency, because as we know, everybody had to go quite digital quite quickly, um, and then how that worked um, and how that influenced subsequent design versions of the strategies. Um, and then how do we apply them then into like a post COVID uh, world um, where there's both interest to be in person again uh, with heritage while also having the digital as um, support for further education. Hey. So kind of a few things go into this research is that um, as we know, tangible heritage has significant economic, social, cultural benefits for society. Um, there's been a lot, obviously, with big um, EU, UNESCO, ICOM, MIMO, that will say that is perfect for our, our strengthening the connections of uh, cultural uh, heritage and society is good for social cohesion, inclusion, uh, well-being, quality of life, um, and also then with a lot of project uh, funding calls as well. But passing down passing down of cultural knowledge from one generation to the next is an active process so therefore measures to preserve that heritage um, and carry out its ability to inform are not passive and need to be active as well um, this is also then presented with even more urgent threats to heritage that are increasing including obviously climate change but also just passing of time conflicts uh, diaspora through migrations um, and then, of course, the, the climate crisis today. Um, and then at the same time, kind of as a, an intersection with it, is the society's adoption of technology. As we know, Moore's Law, um, power and affordability kind of coincide, and the pervasiveness of personal uh, devices are quite powerful and ever growing in. Um, in populations and then and making and smaller so personal devices as well so when these elements come together um or they come at a time where then engagement with heritage is in flux due to the opportunities presented by emergent technologies so preservation through 3d digitization recreates an artifact as the digital representation at the moment in time uh, they retain the physical within the digital domain uh, and combined with supplementary media or metadata, um, transform into mediums for research, exhibition, immersive experiences, and promotion. So then digit digitization methods such as photogrammetry allows a lower entry um, because you can use commodity equipment, um, open source software, or um, educational license software, so lower cost involved um, to produce very high quality models. 
Um, the process of creating digitized heritage offers the opportunity to widen participation within its construction and then deeper, deepen the understanding through holistic interpretation, connect researchers to the communities and communicate knowledge in engaging and accessible ways to be able to stimulate further research. So let's see, as mentioned before, I was saying about that there was a few multinational projects that this has occurred over. So my research and work has occurred over um, quite a few years now and quite a few multinational projects. So um, I know Dr. Alan Miller mentioned earlier about the ELAC Museum, um, Museums Project, which is an award-winning project uh, which expand Latin America, Caribbean, um, and Europe. Uh, we also have Cupido and Cine and Stratus. And then with FIVE, which is why you're all here today, is kind of looking at all those digital outputs um, and putting them together to disseminate and to understand then what's the next step, what's the impact of all of those and uh, moving forward. So this has involved over 80 organizations working collaborati collaboratively uh, to produce uh, over 300, 400 objects, kind of loosely, which ones do you bring in? Um, with over 40,000 views. And we held in-person workshops over nine countries. And we designed virtual, mu virtual museum systems um, to ingress the media and metadata archive, visualize and link to social platforms and aggregators for mass dissemination. Various exhibiting methods for engagement using immersive VR and virtual reconstructions as mediums for storytelling. Uh, deployed in museums, and then evaluation and feedback from heritage, practi heritage practitioners themselves provide insight into aspirations and opportunities that 3D digitization and its engagement uh, can have, or the potential value of it for the future. So out of those findings, um, three strategies or three, three pillars of strategies to achieve 3D preservation and promotion of heritage while also empowering the museum and its community um, include one, I know they're out of order, but this was a long tall one, is content creation. So amassing digital collections um, allows a launching point for heritage organiza organizations to design digital offerings and retain a digital archive uh, to deploy for online dissemination. Two is literacy and competency. So to develop skills, digital skills and literacies, uh, build, um, to build capacity within heritage organizations, uh, but then also to facilitate knowledge exchange um, to leverage resources within the community, because as you know, the community holds quite a lot and you'd be able to bring that in and use that. Um, so you're not ignoring the potential um, positive information. And three is management process and practice, which is then the frameworks uh, and workflows to simplify processes of digitization and its reuse, curation, visualization, exhibition, and promotion to better engage and educate uh, and interact with audiences. So the combination of these strategies help build then the resiliency for heritage when faced with crisis um, and expand their potential, digital potential, um, which then I had mentioned the previous threats, were, which are very direct uh, to heritage. So then when we have something like COVID, uh, it's actually an indirect threat to heritage where it destabilizes the connection of a museum to a community, which then actually then becomes a direct, direct issue um, or a direct threat to the actual heritage. So as we know, communication became mostly digital only. Uh, which forced the heritage, heritage sector to rapidly play catch up uh, on digital know-how. This, however, provided an arena for creative digital experimentation. So aspects of the strategies which accentuated remote engagement came to the forefront, um, such as digital asset reuse, which aligns well with strategy one. Um, and reuse was imperative as new content generation very early on in the lockdown was just it you pretty much couldn't do it unless you could do it out in the landscape um, and to help organizations we worked with on ourselves and meant completing models and pipeline uh, uploading assets reinterpretation of, of already uh, created media and then linking associated organizations to their 3d artifacts if they had just been newly created 
So, and in turn, organizations used the platforms that were easily accessible, so using social media to discuss 3D collections uh, with their online audiences. So two examples, um, just with Barbados Museum and Historical Society, starting conversations, but using 3D as um, kind of that nexus between gathering information and stimulating, um, stimulating conversation. And then also doing something simple as in not everybody has good access to be able to, to um, even go into Sketchfab to have the, the model download and, and to work. Um, so having a video, a spinning video gives just a little bit more than a still image of a 3D object because inherently it's, it's 3D. So it gives just a little bit more and a little bit more interactivity and people know YouTube and, or a video platform. Um, so, Let's see. And also, even though digitization was quite difficult early in the in, um, in lockdown, still kind of ramping up our support through uh, toolkits and videos and um, guides, manuals uh, to provide supplementary step by step um, support for doing it at home, which actually some people did well on them <laughs> to. OK, so then to support the digital skills and knowledge exchange strategy. Um, our workshop, our in-person workshop was reformatted to adapt to virtual webinars. So our first successful series was quite early on in lockdown, um, supported through Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Expo North as part of the Cupido project. Um, I said that funny, Cupido, Cupido, Cupido project. Uh, the success then of the first series led to a second series, uh, which took on uh, feedback and uh, topics that we wanted to do, which en ended up being a bit more specific topics. Um, and then other evidence of success was the uptake of digital creation based on uh, the teachings of each of each series. So people going out into the landscape, doing what they can, going out to the landscape, doing vit virtual tours, creating some 3D objects, um, and then using it maybe into online platforms like digital exhibitions. So when the lockdown measures started to ease a little bit, we saw, um, or one of the things that we did were virtual learning sessions which was more one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, so literally having somebody at a museum going through the whole webinar or webinar workshop of how to do photogrammetry and the process and the steps, um, mostly the photo taking steps um, and doing it right then and there. And then being able to, to come back and forth live to then be able to check uh, photographs and, and, and check fidelity. So, and this um, successful examples were with the West Highland Museum for the West Highland, Highland Museum 100 project, which they were participants in one of the early um, webinars and then came back and with this idea for the, the project. And then with the um, Princess Wales Royal Regiment and Queen's Regiment Museum for a uh, digital only exhibition of Walter Toll. Uh, see? Okay. So then with exhibiting as an element uh, or part of one of the elements, was then we have um, broken down into museum-based exhibiting, museum without walls, remote exhibiting, and museum at home exhibiting. So an expansion, obviously, of the museum, museum at home exhibiting was quite important. Um, so to include with the combination of streaming, and now we just don't think anything of it because that's obviously what we're doing now. But you know, two years ago, two and a half years ago, this was quite like, wow, we got to do this. Um, so an expansion included streaming through OBS to, from Zoom to Facebook Live, um, but to be able to, to directly connect heritage experts to audiences um, and digital heritage uh, for direct communication and dissemination. Live explorations of virtual reconstructions or the 3D objects um, then allowed audiences to discuss it uh, within the medium and this was expanded then to on location learning sessions, um, given strong signal. Uh, we did it actually with Scully at his museum as well, where you could live stream from the place, but then have also streaming of, um, you know, a presentation or other things. And then a fully augmented event was then a mix of on location and a virtual reconstruction uh, to be able to flip back and forth to give context of past and present. Um, which was quite cool. So, and this is, I know I mentioned it, but this was about objects then digitized during lockdowns, then made it into either 
projects that were already starting. So Walter Toll was going to be an in-person exhibition, but then was turned into a digital only format. And then it traveled um, with some, some uh, printed materials, but mostly was all online. And then the West Highland 100 came out of uh, our webinars or virtual webinars. And that was a bit of a, so Walter Toll was all them doing all the, uh, the digitization and West Highland was a mix because we ended up doing quite uh, quite a, a few of their, um, their objects. So talking about infrastructures then, to support 3D creation, uh, creation exhibiting, uh, we have the CAP system, which is based on a, a 3D processing system we had developed for EULAC, but then for CNA and, and it's kind of become a student project, um, building it, building it um, even better, which circumvents, it, circumvents the necessary power processing power to create 3D objects quickly. So photos created through photogrammetry are uploaded, user, users select parameters for construction, and then successful 3D objects are able to be uploaded uh, through a upload form, which is on the right, um, into the virtual museum archive. And then presentation of data and media is then uh, displayed through IIIF uh, open source players um, with full interrogation of 3D assets. A little bit more clinical, obviously, but with all the metadata being able to be pulled from the archive and then any linked objects either within thematically or in any other kind of uh, collection then can be um, can be looked at and 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 gone to within the same player. So I'll wrap up because <laughs> I'm the one pressing for time. So, so what we've learned from our COVID strategies or, or, or the COVID adaptions to the strategies uh, design is one of the lessons learned is that we, it was it was proven resilient, um, which is as a researcher to find out, but it is an, an, an unpredicted threat. Um, second lesson learned was that elements, obviously, which use more online access and personal devices as channels for digital engagement, uh, then had the greatest use um, during times of, of lockdown and restriction. So impact then on organizations and their communities using strategies now in a post-COVID uh, world one, obviously, like we're here today, hybrid approach is expected. Um, however, feedback suggests that in-person experiences and activities are wanting to be the main driver um, because it's been craved after so much isolation. However, expectation is to have continued self-learning, self-driven learning using digital, um, digital heritage engagement after the fact because that was something that was so pivotal for during lockdown, then of course we're gonna have it after. So it's definitely not an afterthought, it is all in together as one entity. Uh, to the rush of digital upskilling for more digital engagement, sector gained creative digital skills in various positions within an organization. So you now have more digitally diverse teams um, within organizations. Three, where have I, yes, understanding of technological capacities is a better understood um, within museums to know how technologies work best for their own work, as well as the investment required for use. So as in, you know, they say there's a better understanding of what maybe goes into a bigger project or using emergent technologies by, uh, other than saying, oh, we would like to have a VR headset. Well, okay, well, what does that entail? What's the creation involved? What's going in it? What is it doing, the interaction? Um, so this allows for a growth of digital offerings and using those newly dig digital skills, knowledge of the technology, but then also with a, a established digital collection allows flexibility and adaptability. So, and then four, finally, a greater online presence of 3D assets, the wider the reach of local collections to a global audience, which contributes to connections made through dissemination and access for academic research. Um, so I'm over time, I'm so sorry. But further understanding uh, of the impact is still evaluated, partly because of the surveys that you need to fill out. If you don't have one, find me and give it to me, please. Um, but that feeds into the outputs of five and hive projects, which is kind of looking at these impacts um, and seeing what then, uh, what is next step forward. 
Um, so thank you for listening. I'm sorry I droned on, um, but if you'd like to see any of our work, um, some of it's outside, but then also you can uh, find us at those, those online links. So thank you. Any questions? Yes, Alice. Um, yeah, I was just wondering the um, photogrammetry workshops that you did online, mm -hmm. were those kind of for people in the heritage and museum sectors, or did you have kind of anybody from kind of wider communities in color? Yeah, you end up getting a mix because you have people that obviously want to build up and, and introduce it into their museum and to their digital strategy. Um, but then also people that are coming interested for the tech of it, people coming from the community because maybe they they have an interest in photo and photography. And so they want to maybe try it at home or be volunteers or are volunteers into the museum and to offer support. Um, because something that we found out from the very beginning of doing the in-person workshops in ULAC, which was all about like, get as many people in, get, you know, but a lot of people sent like an entire organization to come to the workshop. But the thing is you really need like buy-in from like, we well, need buy-in from the whole organization, but you need one or two people that can do it. Um, and then also acknowledging that one of the big, big inhibitors and, and something that was said earlier, um, Christian said earlier was that obviously post-processing is a bit of pain. Um, but why we do, why we go for photogrammetry in that kind of way is, or, or that avenue is because it is something that you can do with your, you do with your phone, you know, and, but then you're, if you're able to do some kind of post-processing, whether it's through you know, MetaShape, through, um, you know, an educational license or open source, um, or then, you know, with the caps being able, like we basically do it, well, that does it, but then we check fidelity. And then if it isn't high enough, then we just go ahead and do it. Um, is that then the data load is not so high, but also then you can, you can develop yourself and, and learn. And that's a whole nother skill to learn. And even if somebody doesn't learn how to do it in all completion, like a incompetency, there's appreciation there. And that even in itself is a big um, if it's something big to learn within an organization to know that, okay, if we want to do this, this is how long it's going to take or the investment or what we need to do to prepare somebody uh, to do it. But um, we have a few good case studies where there has been that initial workshop and then they've taken it and then taught their community and then had community come back to teach the next round. So it's like, it does, it does definitely work, but you almost have to find that you have to have a few interested people and coming in it in different angles. So, yeah, cool. Okay, enough about me. Who's next? Actually, who is next? Somebody have the schedule. Not Maria, you're trusty. All right. He has paused it again, resume share. Didn't like to do it the first time, did it? You do it the second time, it'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Thursday. I'm from the Alfred Magnusson Institute for Aesthetic Studies, and I'm moving uh, to intangible culture here in my presentation. I will be talking about the website Ismos talk about what it is and what can be found there and discuss how, how it can be used as a research tool and also demonstrate some innovation in the uh, dissemination of the data with the aim of increasing public interest. So what is ISMOS? Uh, it is a website based around the database over audio recordings from the ethnographic collections of the Arte Magnusson Institute. On the website, uh, users can browse the collection and listen to the recordings with few exceptions where listening is not permitted by the source. Um, and over time, this database has grown and become a joint project between the Institute and the Musicology Museum, which is a part of the National Library of Iceland. And this is like a rough sketch of the, the data models. Um, yeah, I think it should be highlighted doesn't show on the screen here. 
Uh, but the ethnographic collection, it consists of audio recordings, interviews with people about folklore, music, daily life and place names, to name some examples. Uh, people speak there, sing, play instruments and recite poems. Most of these interviews were recorded in the years 1960 till 1980 by three persons that were traveling around Iceland uh, to seek the older generation and record their memories before they were lost. Uh, something that folklorists are always doing. An older material exists. Um, the oldest recordings are from wax cylinders from the first decade of the 20th century. Um, this material existed on tapes only until Rosa Thorsteinsdóttir at our institute began transferring it to digital form and construct a database for it in the late 90s of the last century. The metadata for the recordings is, consists of uh, information of interviewers, informants, the origins of the persons and homes, and along with keywords, type of performance on the recording, and in case where poetry is recited, a link to the poetry record is uh, presented. Um, I think I'm seeing something different on this screen than this screen. Yeah. No, sorry, it says the color is not showing. <laughs> uh, the musicology section of each verse, it consists of information about churches and instruments that are located there or have existed. Um, and a large database of musicians and bands can also be found. Um, from yeah, and, and this uh, list of, of musicians is from musicians in the late 19th century till contemporary classical musicians and rock stars. And uh, a list of books and manuscripts that contain written music can also be found. And these informations are all linked together. Uh, audio recordings are linked to people, informants and interviewers, places of recordings, poetry and keywords. And people are linked to places and poetry and can be linked to musical pieces, books and uh, and books can be linked to, to persons as authors. And the new version of this website was launched in March this year. Uh, one of the problems we faced about the previous version was that these two sections, music and folklore, was sometimes too tangled together, especially when it came to people in, in the database uh, where an informant born around the year 1900 was in the same list as a pop star born in 1990. Uh, so one of the main focuses on the new website was to to like sharpen the focus between those two fields. Uh, but the task was not only to make things simpler, but also more complicated. Um, two other databases existed about folklore in Iceland. First, there is Sagna Grunur, a database over Icelandic legends in printed folklore collections made by Professor Terry Gunnar at the University of Iceland. And then there's a similar database of fairy tales made by Professor Adelheid Guðmundsdóttir. Sagnagrunnur holds metadata about more than 10,000 legends from printed sources, the oldest from Íslenska Þjóðsögur and Æmintýri, collected by Jón Árnason in the mid 19th century. And the database of fairy tales was smaller with a couple of hundred records. And the legend database and the audio collections have from the beginning been closely related with a shared uh, keyword uh, list. And these two databases were incorporated into Eastmoose database. So we have a, a, a database of folklore from the early 19th century till the present day. So it's uh, like a continuity of tradition that it's now able, uh, people are able to, to search. And how does it all come together? On the screen here, you see the, the front page of the, of the web. Uh, the content is divided into uh, tone list and uh, uh, music and folklore, which is still Friday, uh, and with links to uh, uh, it on each section with two different kinds of data. Uh, on many time, kinds of data can be browsed there. Um, now, this is what I feel that my videos are not here. Okay. All right. Yeah, it is online, just in case, because I was afraid. So, 
Like, you always go into some technical problems. Yeah, I had it prepared as a short link, so I'm very sorry about that. Okay. So we'll start from the beginning again. I have to say everything again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now it's sorry about this interruption. Um, so if we go to the foster part. And we click on the link to the audio list, we are presented with a search interface uh, to search the audio collection. Uh, the search is simple in the beginning, but it's possible to open a more advanced search interface to search by various fields of metadata. By example, uh, you can search by keywords and informants, uh, for example. And by clicking a single audio item, the user sees its metadata, such as keywords, inform informants, and interviewer, and also an audio player. And the auto player is it's fixed to the bottom of the website, so if you can continue browsing without the uh, uh, play button. Um, and if we go to the legends, uh, we see the search interview for the printed legend field, the legend database. So for each legend, we can see information about the job summary of the legend, places that appear in the legend. And information on the informant and in the collection. Um, and more data is collected. Uh, many legends collected by John Orbison in the mid 19th century have images of the original manuscripts, uh, which is a result of a research project about the collection of John Orbison. And also the scanned book pages from, of both the versions from the 1862 and 1950 for enabling users to compare different uh, versions. Thank you, I'm just problems. Sorry, yeah, it's just because we're not screen sharing this screen at the moment. Ah. So you don't see anything. Okay. Can I just make it smaller for a second? Yeah. Or just, is it on, where uh, is it right now? Is it under here? Or just pull it. Yeah. Okay. It's screen sharing, but it's not screen sharing all the screens, mm -hmm. which is uh, okay. Do you have more videos? Yeah, yeah. Why don't could you switch between the two PowerPoint and then go to the video, and then because the Zoom feed then won't we'll get the video. You mean like going from here? Yeah, when you have a video, just go back, and then the Zoom stream will get it. Oh, okay. I'm not sure I understood what you were. Use the, use the PowerPoint, use the, the software PowerPoint, and then if you have a video to play. Yeah, but it's, it's all with you, so. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. What about news here? And like this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Okay. Um, a major challenge in joining these databases was the large number of persons in all of them, and the fact that some of the persons were indeed the same. The printed folklore database about Latin and fairy tales were largely based on the same sources and included many of the same persons. Um, and some of the persons indeed existed in both Latin database and the audio collection. And after many steps of writing scripts to source duplicate records and much manual work, we, we ended up with pretty good results. And this is an example of a good merge of data. This is a man named Skuli Helgerson, born in 1916, who was both an informant and a collector of printed legends, and also informant in five interviews in the audio collection. 
And we are presented here with a tool to view different relationships between persons as network graph. Um, and if you take a look at another person, um, Sigurd Guðmundsson, the painter, was an important uh, figure in the creation of national identity in Iceland in the 19th century. He designed the national costume and laid the ground for the establishment of national museum and national theater. And he also collected folklore, since that was also part of the nationalistic movement. And in a research project about Sigurd and his social network of other influential persons in Iceland around uh, 1860, a collection of letters to and from Sigurd were digitized and scanned, and we got the permission to include them in this uh, database. Um, and in, uh, for the letters, we can read the transcriptions and view an image of the letter on an external uh, website. And connectivity to other systems is also important. And for many of the persons we see links to other databases, for example, uh, hundred.is, which is a, a website about with information and scan images of manuscript collections of the Arne Magnusson Institute, the National Library, and the Arne Magnusson Institute in Copenhagen. So we, we have linked for, for some persons to those two databases. Uh, yeah, here we see pieces of letters that uh, are linked to but if you go a little bit to switch focus to the music and look at more contemporary person in that the music database that uh, maybe some of you know this uh, this musician uh, Björk. Um, she was a member of the band's Tapi Tikaras and the Sugar Cubes before she started her solo career. And relations between hundreds of musicians have been registered in this database. And using network uh, visualizations again, we can browse these relations. For each musician, we, we see which bands they have been members of and uh, all the members of those bands. And given the fact that we have pretty complex and rich data, it was tempting to attempt to visualize the whole network of musicians and bands. So we use the three-dimensional network graph to display the relations and enable the users to rotate it and, and, and zoom into it. And this is, uh, that network is running on uh, open source JavaScript and has a graph database behind it. So now I'm talking faster than my, my video. And here we are, we can highlight the relations uh, of this uh, graph over there. So here we see the network of all the bands and all the musicians in the in the database. And it's a it's quite powerful uh, uh, visualization. And the interesting the the knot down there it's the Icelandic Symphony Orchestra, which is apparently the biggest, the biggest band that we, we know about in, in Iceland. Um, and Eastwood is a project to grow, and it doesn't stop here. More material waits in the audio collection to be digitized and put online. And the data, data has room for more data types and different kinds. Um, and this website is it's it's quite popular. We get around uh, 250 users every day, and it has a personal connection to users since you can hear your deceased relatives there. I, for example, got a chance to hear my grandfather's voice, who died when I was six years old. Um, and the audio collection have, has been an inspiration to artists who have remixed, remade, and used the material in their own creativity. And performance of Reamer that appear here have ended up in the rap scene of Iceland and electronic musicians have, has, have used the recordings for their work. And I'm going to end with a small experiment here, which is uh, the radio. Uh, we have thousands of uh, the files. We have around 2000 hours of interviews. And the oldest is from 1904. And the youngest is from 2009, I think. So we created this radio, which doesn't have a, like a frequency, but it has the time as the as the frequency 
uh, spectrum. So I'm gonna start this here and I have some uh, sound, which I hope you will hear. And this is available on eSmooth.es. <laughs> You just turn and you add that somewhere. And then we turn and we find something. Yes, thank you. Metadata across the different databases. How easy? Yeah, or how consistent with the metadata? Yeah. I mean, the Latin database and the Ferritas database is very, it was very similar. I mean, it's both printed material and had informants and, um, and collectors and keywords linked to it. But I mean, it was a yeah. I mean, it was a task of like changing the database a little bit and, and making it fit. But I mean, with a database like this, you, it's pretty complex on behind. I mean, we have many tables, and but I mean, we, we managed to to create these links between the materials through the persons. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's and I mean, one of the tasks was to like eliminate duplicate records. It's. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think we still have some duplicate records, so we find even soon. Yeah. The share screen is the session over the uh, screen. No, it's the, I think there was before. I okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. just the screen. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll try to be stricter with time, which is not the but I feel like Stephen's going to come in and be straight up at some point. So, <laughs> okay. you go like this if it's like, you know, a minute to 15 or. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Maria Andre, and I'm from the University of St. Andrews. And uh, thank you all for being here. I'm very happy to be here. I've always wanted to come to Iceland, and it's even cooler that I get to share one of my passions today with you. So today I will be talking about how we can enhance ecological behavior with virtual reality. Uh, so science has shown us that anthropogenic factors have induced a spike in temperatures over time. And as you can see in this graph, this basically depicts temperature change over the last 140 years or so. Um, so towards the middle of the 20th century, there was, although the climate was cooling, there was a sudden spike in the average global temperature. And this perfectly coincided with a huge increase in human activity, which is a phenomenon that scientists call the Great Acceleration. Um, so why am I actually here? Well, I believe uh, when it comes to climate change, there's just so much to care about. And here I've just listed a few aspects of it that I believe are worth mentioning. So the first one is the melting permafrost and ice. We've all heard of the melting ice sheets that reside in the polar regions of our world. Well, this is very risky to us, um, firstly because we are at high risk of losing some of the most iconic animals that have ever lived on the planet. And those include whales and polar bears and emperor penguins, which are all very dependent on ice. But also um, the polar regions are extremely important for regulating the global climate. So as the ice is melting in those regions, we then see everywhere more extreme weather events. 
And these extreme weather events can uh, vary. So we have extreme uh, heat waves that can be lethal, especially to older populations, to a more frequent formation of extreme storms, as well as prolonged precipitation. So this brings up uh, further challenges, unfortunately. So as we see extreme storms and prolonged rainfall, um, well, this increases sea levels, which in turn um, floods our coastlines and causes coastal erosion. So coastal communities, I believe, make up around 40% of the world's population. And they're already quite vulnerable because coastal communities do suffer from enhanced isolation. And uh, it's been shown that this is linked to more mental problems and general um, decreases in well-being. So as the coastal floods, there's also um, loss of settlements as well as of commercial buildings and of key infrastructure such as transportation links and so on. And this only enhances the isolation the coastal communities are actually suffering from. What's more in the future due to climate change, we also expect an increase in human mortality, not only because of the direct damage done by extreme weather events, but also because climate change will definitely modify the way our food crops grow and the way viruses spread and form. So scientists do expect more diseases in the future that will present quite a high risk for the human population. And I appreciate this is all very depressing, but it's all uphill from here. Um, so science does agree. Um, all these effects are reversible. However, in order to really solve the climate crisis, there is a huge need for a change in human behavior. But of course, that's never easy. But in the case of climate change, this is particularly complicated due to psychological distance from climate change. So what does this actually mean? Well, to human perception, climate change information is very abstract because we think of climate change events to be slow, especially when it comes to sea level rise and distant from us. So unfortunately, abstract information has nothing to do with action. Only concrete information influences human behavior. However, there's good news. Uh, VR has been shown to reduce psychological distance from, uh, from climate change uh, by enabling people to visualize it and experience it in, the in a more direct way. And in turn, reducing psychological distance has been shown to lead to an increase in ecological behavior and attitudes. So just a few words on the VR market in general. Obviously we have seen a huge growth since the year 2016 and the market is expected to reach about 100 billion by 2025. Um, what's really important when it comes to the VR market is that um, although mostly creative sectors are using this technology, Researchers do expect this to change in the future because this technology has shown a lot of benefits in education and training. So some people named VR uh, the ultimate empathy machine or a new grammar for story storytelling and emotions. And this is because VR does enable people to then feel closer to global issues because uh, it empowers them to grasp abstract concepts and make information concrete through visualization and direct experience. And as aforementioned, climate change VR applications have been demonstrated to reduce psychological distance and increase ecological attitudes. But despite all these benefits, which sound great really um, to solve our issue, um, only very few projects have been developed uh, in relation to climate change virtual reality, and most of them are actually inaccessible or they require very expensive hardware. When I was doing my research, um, a different aspect that really surprised me is that there are no VR experiences of Antarctica or Scotland that depict the way climate change will affect these regions. And this was very surprising to me because these two particular um, areas are hugely important for the world in terms of uh, economic interests, social interests, and even scientific interests. Another important aspect that I discovered was that uh, most researchers expect VR applications to be successful if they are free, accessible online, and don't require expensive equipment. So taking all of this into consideration, I decided to carry out my own research project under the supervision of Dr. Alan Miller, who was a keynote speaker today. I think you will uh, seen him. 
And I created a virtual reality application, which demonstrates coastal erosion in the east of Scotland. So this is actually an image taken from the simulation. And it depicts uh, an area called Tensmere Nature Reserve, which is highly important in Scotland. So it is composed, as you can see, of the forest and the beach. And basically users, when they open the application, they're directly transported into the environment and they're able to walk around, explore the forest and the beach, but then by interacting with the keyboard, um, they can decide when they want to flood the environment. So essentially they press the key and then there's a gradual flooding over the, pan, uh, over the span of 10 seconds. So I've included some before and after pictures um, in relation to the flooding. And this is a perspective from inside the forest. So this particular application was built using Unreal Engine 4, uh, which is a powerful game development software tool that has been proven to render more realistic visualizations compared to other uh, similar methods. Uh, a really important aspect for me was to create an accurate representation of the environment. So uh, my team and I actually imported geological data from DigiMap, and then uh, we put it into Unreal Engine Editor, which gave us a very accurate representation of the water levels and terrain levels. And what's more, while I was editing the environment, we also included a map of Tansmere Nature Reserve on top of it. So I could, as I was deciding, oh, I'm gonna put a tree here and here, I could really see where everything needed to go. So uh, we got quite an accurate representation of the nature reserve, which is quite cool, I think. Um, so what have we learned by carrying out that research? So we asked a group of users to firstly test our application and then also look into what are some of the most commonly used uh, tools today to teach the public about coastal erosion and coastal flooding. So these tools are generally um, interactive maps so they're quite similar to just a regular digital map online, but then um, users can decide then where to be transported into the future. And basically the land changes based on which point you are in the future. So that's how interactive maps work. And what we discovered is that all users uh, thought that using the VR simulation was an engaging learning experience. But what's more, they all preferred learning about the coastal impacts of climate change through VR instead of the currently used methods, because they did not think that interactive maps were as intuitive. Our project did come with some limitations. So we basically looked at how engaging the learning experience was, but we didn't actually quantify whether or not the VR application reduced psychological distance from climate change. And what's more, um, so this was a master's thesis research project, uh, which meant it was short term and with limited resources. So we only got to visualize a single physical aspect of climate change, which was just the increasing water levels in the environment. But obviously to coastal erosion, there's many more elements such as precipitation and changes in biodiversity. So what's next for us? Um, well, we want to scale our research and to apply it to two new use cases. Um, so these are Antarctica and Scotland. You can't really see there, but it says Scotland. And basically what this means, so we want to actually create the first ever VR visualization of Antarctica. And um, this will focus on a select area in the Antarctic Peninsula. So um, the Antarctic Peninsula is a part in the west of the continent, which is actually one of the fastest warming um, regions on the planet. And it's also the most visited sites in Antarctica with over 70K visitors per year. So the VR experience will allow users everywhere to explore this really remote natural heritage, but then also visualize different aspects of climate change. So this will vary from melting icebergs to changes in biodiversity and rainfall. Um, why I want to include the Scotland use case as well next to this is because water from Antarctica's and Greenland's ice sheets has been shown to cause about two thirds of sea level rise, which automatically puts coastlines at risk from uh, coastal erosion and flooding. And Scotland's coastline is um, particularly vulnerable when it comes to this issue. 
So I believe if we include both these visualizations, one of Antarctica and one of Scotland, it will be really cool to educate the public about the connection between the two. Because although they're thousands of miles away, they impact each other very much. So of course, um, apart from focusing on our environment about Antarctica, we're also going to improve our visualization of Scotland. So I, I want to build more um, complex visualizations and include more aspects of climate change in what we have so far as well. And during the testing and evaluation phase, we really want to focus on how our VR applications um, impact psychological distance from climate change and whether or not they do lead to an increase in pro-environmental behavior. So to assess this, we're gonna test it with two groups of people. So the first one is going to be people who have actually been to Antarctica and have seen the heritage first, uh, firsthand. And then compare it to how a group of people who has not visited Antarctica um, reacts to the project. And we believe this will give us a more accurate insight into exactly how our VR project will uh, determine ecological behavior. So thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, I've also included a sources section for anyone that's interested, but yeah, this was it. Thank you. How uh, do you see it being extended then with other countries or, or just limited to Antarctica and so on? Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. I think for sure there's a lot of possibility to visualize a lot of heritage sites. Uh, but for now, I'm mostly trying to consider how to scale this particular project to more countries. So for example, where I put in schools or in companies or how to educate the public with what we have so far. But yeah, I think afterwards, there's definitely a few sites as well that I'd like to visualize more. Including like cultural heritage sites, not heritage, but I was thinking mostly about natural heritage just because that's my main passion. But uh, I'm also open to develop my education for very extended by learn more. <laughs> Must. <laughs> mm. Okay. Uh, I'm Stuart Massey from Robert Gordon University. I will try and keep it relatively short. And I don't have any VR, don't have any 3D, uh, but we're looking at stories. So we still have aspects of digital preservation and uh, sustainability. And so we're going to talk about the story tagging project and how it's developed into Northward as a brand and its sort of take on non digital preservation and sustainability. So just to give some background, uh, story tagging is a NPA funded project. It's been going probably close to a couple of years. It's coming up for completion. So it's still very much an ongoing project finishing up towards the end of the year. It's um, had uh, issues with COVID, I guess, and timing, but it's still still progressing very well. Uh, I'll talk a minute about the partners next slide. So in terms of Northward, it's sort of rather than the project, it's the brand that's developed out of story tagging in terms of look and feel, how we present the material, how the digital platform looks and how the, the workshops and the likes are, are, are branded. In terms of partners, there's a mix of partners across Scotland, Ireland, Scandinavia, a mix of type of partners as well, a mix between universities and uh, heritage organisations, I guess, organisations with stories. So with Scotland, we've got Robert Gordon University and Highlands Islands. In Ireland, we've got Ulster University. And then in Ireland, Scandinavia and Finland, We've got heritage organisations as well that sort of contribute to the story side of it, while the universities contribute more to the, the organising of the competition and the, the showcasing the, the events. So in terms of the basic idea, and I guess it's part of the way towards, one way towards 
preservation and sustainability is to add value to the heritage content, to say make it make it have value and be used in different ways. Uh, and that's really what the, the sort of key idea was here. So the key idea is how can we use location-based stories in remote areas, rich in culture and heritage, and how can we use that to promote local creatives from those areas as an effective marketing tool, how we can link the two together and commercialize or, or promote creatives. So it was done as a competition, and the idea is that we gather a set of stories, we make those available for creatives to bid on, so creatives then can bid on the stories, and the idea is the creative creates a product that's linked to the story. So that's a link between the story and the creative. And they, they do it by creating a product and there's a prize money for being selected in effect. So it, it's a competition to bid for that. In terms of that approach, it was very, very successful. Was massively outbidded in you know, a massive amount of applications and compared with what we could fund. It's a relatively small project. We have uh, we're sort of in the east of Scotland with Arju with 30 stories, similar to, to the west and over in Ireland and Scandinavia, it's probably much the same. Originally just going to be funding eight in east and west Scotland. We ended up getting more funding, up to 15 uh, creatives being funded. And the sort of examples we have here is uh, Izzy Thompson, who's a local painter tied in with this Colman story of the disappearing village. And the product there was a set of paintings that linked into her imagination of how it would be as Colman started disappearing. And that was the, the product that was linking the story uh, to the practitioner and to setting up that, that sort of three side part. So different threads in this project. There's the competition side in gathering stories, publishing competition, uh, awarding creatives, following up and completion. That's the competition side. But also sort of the dissemination side in terms of the digital platform, which we'll talk a bit more in a minute. That's my focus. And sort of the other areas and sort of promoting it with social media, workshop showcases and the likes. So that's the background in terms of story tagging. So the other area we're looking at sort of preservation and sustainability was around about the digital platform. And what I mean by digital platform, I guess I just mean a repository of stories or practitioners or products that's going to stay there and last beyond the uh, beyond just the length of the project. Why we wanted that very much around about preservation and uh, sustainability. Very typical scenarios, we'd have small, diverse storytelling groups. Generally, we'd have projects that would last as long as the funding would last. And unless there was some way of taking that funding forward, the project sort of dies off, the content gets lost, and we start losing the, uh, we lose the resource that's been built up in effect. There's a lot of effort in creating stories. It should be a resource, and we should be working at ways to keep it. And so we're trying to do that through this project in terms of digital platform, which is probably in itself not really for the project, but the intention is to keep going beyond and find ways of reusing it. Across technology, another issue, doing individual projects, technology is expensive. If we can create the technology solution once and not have to do it many times, again, addresses that sort of challenge. So that was the sort of areas we were, we were trying to address and, and why we went for this digital platform sort of solution. But in doing that, we sort of recognized we need a complete solution. So not just a, not just a website, we need to cover the whole thing. So we need to make it really easy for people to create stories without going to admissions. We need to have a process of publishing them. So they go from draft through to release, through to published, and then the viewing and analyzing to feedback to the creatives who's, who's looked at the products, where they've come from, who's looking at the different stories. So the intention is for a complete platform with the, all these components built into it. In terms of more like the architecture, it's again, the two sides to it, 
top sides got our curation with our storytellers who are creating content, making sure we have sufficient metadata so it can be stored, it can be searched, it can be filtered, it can be used in different ways in the future if we want to use it uh, I mean, just in different ways, around about different categories, around about different themes. So we've got our four repositories for the contents here. So kind of creatives, the products and skills, main focus was sort of on the stories, but we also have the other areas as well. And then the bottom side there is being able to view this in different ways, so we can view it via the web, but also being able to view it through mobiles, through Apple, through Android. And potentially in future, we can look at different ways of viewing this, not worrying about the competition we're creating, but you could use the content and the resource in different ways. So it's an ongoing project. We're not quite there yet. We're making good progress. I'll give you a URL at the end. This is where we've got in development in terms of live. So far, it's just stories. Some screenshots of our application in terms of curating. So the left, you see us capturing, uh, we're capturing metadata. There's a very sort of intuitive uh, web editor allowing you to create content. You can drag in multimedia content, audio was sort of a big focus here for audio stories, but equally it could be images of, uh, or video. We've got some other tabs there that allow you to choose different languages. So you can choose different languages to make it in in English, in Gaelic, in Scots, whichever languages you're wanting to, to cover and have similar content in there. It's location-based, so there'll be a tab up there where you can identify the location, go to Google Maps, you pin where it is and identify and tie the story to the location. In terms of viewing, much the same, it just gives more, uh, more variation in viewing. You've got the map view of the stories, so I've got the example there of where the stories are around the north of Scotland on the east and west side. There's a refine button there that gives you full search and filter around the metadata we've captured. And then you get to the stories which presented as a card and then you can select them and go down into the individual details. So just to finish up, I'll take so a minute to look at the, the sort of opportunities and, and where we've got to with this. It's tend to be successful in terms of the project, but really we're trying to do something more than that. And we want to sort of see this as something that can go forward. So we look at it in terms of the, the content as being useful and being a resource that's reusable or extendable. And we're certainly looking at ways that we can take the competition forward and offer it as a, a sort of annual competition using the same platform and then once it's been developed, it's it's quite easy and quite effective to take it forward. And similarly with the platform, once it's in place, it's very easy to use it in different ways, whether we want to use it in uh, to set up trails or to just continue with this with a slightly different ways. Really interested in gamification to give more value to it, to things like setting up trails, uh, setting up treasure hunts, unlocking content when you get there, and bringing in AR, VR, things like that as well. I think that's more or less it. Uh, other opportunities, certainly opportunities around about des destination marketing, and part of what we're doing is trying to give value to the data that allows it to be sustainable by having, having value in, and different ways of using the data. Okay, I'm a really quick run through of story time. Thank you. So the link up there to the URL, link there to other URLs in the project. Uh, if you get the chance, have a look at it. Is there any questions? Yeah, there's one here. I might have missed it, but um, with like community buy-in with adding stories, like do you have target communities that you've, you've done, or is it just from... Um, well, there's certainly target areas in that it was sort of the remote areas we had sort of half the highlands and over to the east and up north into Orkney and Shetland and the rural areas over on the left uh, were Highlands Islands University. So they were certainly split in terms of remote areas. I guess in gathering the stories, so there was a vast number of stories came up and they cut it down to 30. So uh, 
I'm not so involved in that process, but in cutting down the stories, they're in effect choosing communities and areas that they want to to support, I guess, in that those are the those are the stories that local creatives can bid on. So they're choosing a story for Colman, which is just south of Inverness, north of North Labrador and on the coast there, you're choosing that area as, as really creative around there that you're expecting to bid for it. Very cool format. The competition side had been amazingly successful. It was was very nice to see, especially over COVID sort of time. Uh, that was a disappointing time. We didn't really get a chance to meet face to face near as much as we would have liked, which I think would have got a lot more attention to it. Uh, but still, yeah, still, still worked really well. I can't wait to see what keeps going with it. I know you're NPA funding with this, but see what. Yes, <laughs> I know, you know exactly. What happens then? Yes. There's ways. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, and thank you, everybody. I know we've gone over a little bit, but I also want to give everybody the chance to say what they need to say. And also asking them the questions to a little bit deeper. So I think that's worth like 22 minutes of their story. There's coffee and stuff outside. But thank you, everybody. That was a really great group.